uh, hearing. So this is the last topic of hearing. Um, and uh, just to let everyone know, um, we you have a quiz on Wednesday, and it's the only thing you need to do for this class on Wednesday. Um, you will have from midnight Wednesday to 11.59 Wednesday to complete the quiz. You'll have 50 minutes to complete it. It'll look exactly like what you've seen already, uh, multiple choice and short answer. And um, it's open note, um, open book, that sort of thing. Just You have, just have 50 minutes to do it. So if you do engage in open note, open book, you can't look up. You likely don't have the time to look up every single answer okay um but open note open open slide um open open book okay and so no lecture on wednesday um as far as i'm aware so this is the only like this is the only stream um for this week because two uh uh, uh tuesday <laughs> friday is good friday and so there are no classes on friday so wednesday is a quiz um no classes on friday no classes the following monday so i actually won't see you all again for this class, I may see you in another class, but if you aren't in any of my classes, uh, any of my other classes, then I won't see you through this until next Wednesday, um, based on the, uh, the way that things go. So, you know, join us tonight if you want, uh, for the chill, no work, no school, no school stream. Um, I decided I am gonna do that. So, um, yeah, heard, heard back from a few of you, so... I call it critical critical mass. So let's finish up hearing, and um, this will constitute the end of the material for the quiz. Spoiler alert: I have not made the quiz. <laughs> it's not on Brightspace at all, so that's a, a task for tomorrow. Um, so um, I don't know what's going to be on it yet. All right, so let's do this. Um, I don't know where to hide it. I hide it in my furnace room. Oh, oh, okay, cool. Sounds good. Great. Ollie's, uh, what Ollie's birthday present just came in the mail. He's not supposed to know. All right. So we were gonna start here. Uh, so from Friday we ended on this slide. There was nothing on it, so we're gonna start in the same magic. We're gonna start in the same spot. So with with uh, vision, we talked about the what and where pathways, right? Object recognition versus spatial recognition. Um, there's a similar situation for hearing. There is a what and where auditory pathway. Um, and so we'll go through both of those. And so um, the what and the where, um, the what and the where, not off the top of my head, Cami, sorry. Uh, not chapters, definitely not chapters. I, I don't really know, because I move stuff around so much. It's, it's on the new syllabus. Um, so the what and the where pathways, whew, turn white, okay. Um, so the what and the where pathways uh, help us identify with um, where sound is and what sound is. So the what pathway is the ventral stream, which is pretty much the same as the vision pathway. So you can at least, if you have the mnemonic set up for vision, you can at least um, do the same for hearing, okay? So the what pathway goes from the, you know what? Let me, um, let me switch views here because I'm gonna rearrange some, some slides. So give me one second. I'm gonna rearrange some slides because these two slides need to be. We didn't go. We didn't get to these two slides um, the other day. So before we get to the what and where pathways, I'll come back to them. Um. But I think this will be better. This is what happens when you don't um, get to something and you forget that you didn't get to it. And you refer to it later, but then you didn't get to it, so you didn't refer to it. So, you know, online teaching, right? Whee! All right, so I need to describe some brain areas for, 
are. I need to describe some brain areas first before we can finish with the what and where pathways. Um, so the Sonic MGM is what you really need to know when it comes to hearing. It is um, where all of the auditory information ends up going. So the Sonic MGM is, is a bunch of different parts put together. Okay, so the son is the superior olivary nucleus, and that is superior ovulary nucleus that receives the information from the auditor or from the yeah from the auditory nerve. I was I got confused. So I almost called it optic nerve because um, you can see that actually your ears are below your temporal lobe. It might not seem that way, but your ears are, uh, and your especially your inner ears, are actually below the temporal lobes of your brain. It kind of doesn't seem that way because it kind of seems like everything's smooshed in there, but yeah, it's, it's below. And so the son, the super ovulary nucleus, actually goes into the brainstem first, specifically the midbrain of the brainstem, so just below the cortex, right? Just below the diencephalon, just below the thalamus, okay? Um, and then from there, that goes up into the inferior colliculus, and you have two of them, so it's the inferior colliculi, right? Which are these two structures here, Okay, so you, information going up here, and you can see information from the right ear, this one here, goes in red, and the information from the left ear goes in here and blue. So the son receives the information from the auditory nerve, slash the cochlea, yes, Stephanie. And so then that sends it up into um the inferior colliculus okay which is below the superior colliculus which is vision orientation okay so the inferior colliculus and then from there goes into the mgn which is a structure in the thalamus which is on the inside of the thalamus which is the medial geniculate nucleus remember we talked about the lgn with vision that was the lateral geniculate nucleus. Now this is the MGN, the medial. So it's the middle portions of the thalamus. Okay, so these two red structures here, that's technically inside the thalamic structure. Just with this coronal cross-section, you're not going to be able to see that um, with the way that they've done this. And so these two structures are in the thalamus. They're in the middle part, the medial part of the thalamus, okay? So sonic MGM. And then that goes all the way to the primary auditory cortex, A1, which is um, this green here on in the temporal lobe. It's basically in the, temp uh, the parietal temporal uh, junction area uh, or the... Um, the temporal sulcus. Okay, which is that giant um, fold here, okay? And so you have that. Um, now, our hearing is lateralized uh, in much the same way that our vision is, okay? So right ear information does, the vast majority of it, go to the left hemisphere and left ear information goes to the right hemisphere, now, I do want to point out, though, that you can see red and blue going to both. And so it's not fully lateralized. It's not fully lateralized. There is still information from your right ear that goes to the right uh, A1. And then there's still information from the left ear that goes to the left A1. It's, the vast majority is lateralized, though. I do want to point that out. But it is not fully lateralized, like the um, vision is. Okay? Or other... Or other um, uh, things. I could turn in different colors over here. I think I'm turning coloris, coloris, coloroos. All right. Other areas. So let's talk about the cortex and auditory cortexes. So there are three places that I want you to know about the auditory cortex. So there is the core area. 
the belt area and the parabelt area. And un unfortunately, for some reason, uh, your your the uh, book illustrators, the, the the folks that make the um, images for the textbook at Cengage or whoever, um, decided that they weren't going to illustrate the belt and parabelt areas on the human brain, only on the monkey brain. Essentially the same areas, but unfortunately not as descriptive because it's actually a smaller area. Maybe that's why, because it's larger. It's larger on the um, uh, monkey brain. But what I want you to point out is here's A1, right? So that's the primary auditory cortex. That's where information comes first from Sonic, okay? Sonic MGM. Okay, MGN, sorry, not MGM. Um, and that area is right here. So A1 is this blue area here. That's how they correspond to each other, okay? So this blue area here is this orangey A1 area, okay? A1 exists in what is called the core area of the primary receiving cortex, okay? Surrounding the core area is the belt area, okay? Beneath the belt area in the temporal lobe is the para-belt area, and you can see here the direction of travel, okay? So we go from core area to belt area to para-belt area, okay? Does that make sense? So we'll talk about these functions when we get to organization. So the core area, the belt area, and the parabelt area are gonna come up right right now. <laughs> I'm gonna go back to the, the what and where pathways, okay? Uh, any questions about the areas that we're talking about? So we're essentially hanging out on the temporal lobe, okay? All right, back to the what and where pathways, okay? So, the what pathway or the ventral stream goes downward, okay? It goes downward from the primary receiving cortex, A1. So that's the direction of flow that you just saw, okay? The direction of flow that you just saw. That's the ventral stream, okay? Starts in the anterior portion of the core, okay? The forward portion of the core and belt. So it goes from core to belt, and then it goes to the prefrontal cortex, okay? goes to the prefrontal cortex. That's for identification of sounds. It just goes toward the prefrontal cortex and extends somewhat into the prefrontal cortex, but it's not forever there, okay? The dorsal stream, or the wear pathway, starts in the back of the core area and extends to the parietal lobe and then into the prefrontal cortex. Okay, so it goes up and then forward. Okay, dorsal, up, forward. Okay, and that's for sound location. And most of this comes from many of the data streams that we have been talking about all semester. So neural recordings in animals, brain damage in humans, and then brain scans. Okay, pretty, pretty solid set of evidence that ventral stream is for identification, just like with vision. Dorsal stream, for location, just like vision, okay? It's like our brain has some sort of map. So that's good. At least those correspond, okay? Um, switching gears to further organization, um, we have to organize what we consider to be direct sound, and we have to organize what we consider to be indirect sound. And those things, ch and, and the difference between those change because of how they hit our ear, based on the reflections. So direct sound comes directly to our ear. There's no reflection, it's straight from the audio source to our ears. Okay, that gets organized as direct sound. We, uh, and, and specifically, if our head is oriented 
to the audio source, we'll probably be pretty good at picking that up through the dorsal stream. Okay. Uh, because as we talked about on Friday, locating in front of our face is the best possible way, right? Um, oh, man. Sorry. My ear itched. Uh, indirect sound is way different, though. Okay. And so locating the source of indirect sound is going to reflect off the wall, right? So if we're in this... We're in this space here. If you were in an auditorium or whatever, so you would have indir you would have direct sound as the red line, right? Outside, there is no such thing as indirect sound because none of it's going to reflect on you. So if it's fully open, if your environment's fully open, there's no indirect sound whatsoever. Okay. Um, if you're in a building, as indicated by this right here, right? the acoustics of a building and those of you who are singers um or uh instrument players instrumentalists um have to know a lot about acoustics right and how the indirect sound is going to reach the listener okay this changes the quality of the sound and it also changes how we perceive the location of the of the sound direct sound easy peasy lemon squeezy Indirect sound, dare I say, surround sound. The, the, the best example I can give you of this is, are, are, if you're familiar with like new um, surround sound experiences like Dolby Atmos, okay? Where you might have um, a sound bar or something like that that has upward firing speakers. So most speakers are faced toward the listener, right? You just have forward-facing speakers. Atmos speakers actually are tilted upward at about 30, 40, 45, somewhere, somewhere around there, 45 degrees. I'll just say 45 degrees. So they are tilted and they're fire at the ceiling. So they come down at you at an angle like this, like um, number four or number three, depending on, yeah, number four is pretty much. And so you're gonna actually perceive that sound as um, above you, right? Sound is not actually coming from above you though. So indirect sound does change the nature of trying to locate sound and how we then organize it um, later, okay? This is pretty cool. Uh, if you're inter in interested in uh, surround sound speaker system setups or Atmos setups, if you have a TV that can Transmit Atmos, Dol Dolby Atmos, or, or um, um, DDS Virtual X, if you're familiar with those technologies. If you're not familiar with any words that are coming out of my mouth now, then forget it. Don't worry about it. Just listen. <laughs> Just watch TV on your TV speakers. It's fine. It was not fine. <laughs> As a cinephile, I, I, I cannot abide by watching anything on TV speakers. They're just awful. All right, moving on. So we talked about the auditory space the other day, okay? Um, the auditory scene is a related concept, okay? And instead of the space, it's a, uh, a the array of sounds that you are, um, are hearing, okay? So if you're at a concert, if you're at a concert, and um, you are watching a band, and you see that um, you know the guitar is making this waveform, as we've talked about waveforms. The singer is making this waveform, right? And the keyboardist is making this waveform. All of that is going to coalesce into the auditory scene, to the auditory. Um, information that is coming into your ear it's a complex set of sounds this very difficult to separate in sort of a digital fashion but our our ears can actually do some of that separation it's pretty cool because we engage in auditory scene analysis now the analysis makes this sound like you're doing complex math in your head but you're not really and it's just 
how you separate sounds and how you can focus on some sounds and how you can focus on other sounds and and sort of put them together or separate them. Um, I know what I do, and this may be you if you go to concerts or you listen to a lot of music, is sometimes there's a rich bass and you're just like, yeah, I'm really like focusing on this bass right now. And then sometimes there's a really good guitar riff or you just want to focus on the lyrics of the sing- you know, that the singer's singing. And so you then, other things fall away, okay? Um, this analysis is happening in your brain as opposed to at the cochlea. The cochlea and of the basilar membrane, um, they all come together as this, okay? Because that's what the sound energy is doing. That's that's all the basilar membrane and the cochlea can deal with. Okay, the separation of the scene occurs in your auditory cortexes. Okay, which is pretty cool. Um, and we've developed, we've evolved several heuristics that help us separate those auditory scenes into various components, right? Being able to perceive different sounds from different sources within a given auditory space, right? And so those heuristics, and then I'm just, I'm, these are not all of them. This is not an exhaustive list. Um, excuse me, I don't want to be a ghost color. Thank you. Um, so these are just three of them. And then I have a demo of, oh, which one do I have a demo of? I think I have a demo of similarity of timber and pitch. I think I have, that's, I think that's what the demo is. Um, I don't know if it's going to work well in our remote situation. We'll do what we can. We'll do what we can. Um, And so we have onset time. That's the first one. It's the first one I want to talk about. Sounds that start at different times are likely to come at different sources. So we, um, much like light from above heuristic, this one's pretty solidly accurate as a heuristic most of the time. If the source of the sound uh, has different timing, then we think, then we gauge that those two things are different things okay different objects different sources different things okay um like the oh a good example would be what again watching a a uh, um a band play at a concert okay different sources location a single sound source tends to come from one location and to move continuously so if a sound stays the same, then we can track its location pretty well. Okay. Um, there's actually a really good. Oh, what's the White Rabbit Project? So this was like a follow-up to MythBusters. Through, if you're familiar with MythBusters, uh, Katie, Katie. Oh my God, that's not her name. Um, Carrie. Uh. Tori and uh, Grant did this show. I think it came out in 2016, four or five years ago, something like that, called The Weight Rabbit Project. And one of the uh, episodes they they do is they talk about the backup beeping. And this might actually be one of your perception problems. I can't remember. But they did the backup beeping of trucks, right? I know there's one with, like, neon, neon yellow for emergency vehicles. I, mean, I can't remember if there's one if this is the one for the sound location one. Um, you know the backing up of, of trucks, the beep, 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 beep. We're actually very bad at taking that simple tone and figuring out location from it. Um, and they te- so they tested that against a static a burst of static, um, which is a complex tone. Static is a complex tone. It's a wavelength that has a bunch of, of of frequencies associated with it and because of that we were actually uh, they were actually really good at determining location um and some companies have adopted static as uh, a um 
a backup source because the beeping doesn't really tell us where we need to look in order to not get run over by a large vehicle that can't see us, right? But the static does work, and that's essentially this this uh, location heuristic working working well, okay? And then similarity of timber and pitch, similar sounds are grouped together. So this is the um, this is the example that I have of this one, right? So compound melodic line. I don't. It, for those of you who know music and read music, uh, in music is an example of auditory stream segregation, right? So things that sound similar are grouped together, kind of in line with gestalt. And so this is um, this this is the idea here. Um, I'm not entirely sure how to read the um, bars here, so we're just gonna we're just gonna do this. I'm just gonna show you this. This is uh, oh, this is from uh, Bach, by the way. This is the choral uh, prelude on Jesus Christus Unsa uh, uh, Highland. Um, Jesus Christus obviously is Jesus Christ um, for the uninitiated. That's that was German. So that's four four measures four measures of that Bach piece. Um, and if you play it rapidly. The upper notes become perceptually grouped together. The upper notes, I guess that's the blue, um, become grouped together. So these three notes become grouped together. And the, I guess that's red or purple. These uh, lower notes also become grouped together. Okay. And so the stream then becomes separated even as you move up octaves. Um, and so um, I'm going to play it here. I'm going to pause the other music so it doesn't uh get conflated okay everybody ready i hope this works turn up your volume get those engines revved okay everybody ready How do we do? Do you start hearing the high notes and the low notes then just like going back and forth? Huh, 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 with like obviously little bits in between. That's what makes the, that's what makes it nice. But um, what did we hear? If anything at all, what did we hear? I heard the grouping. Okay, cool. All right. Kinda, yeah, definitely. Yeah, kinda, okay. Did my finger help? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Lots of slight variations in grouping, yeah. Yeah, it took a second. So it started. Uh, it, it's it it started slow, but but um, picked up, and it's probably because of the violin player. Obviously, started slow. Yeah. Um. So that is uh the third heuristic that I want. So it's timber and pitch. Um, that seemingly sound the same, right? Because remember, pitch 
and timber are two perceptual uh, two perceptual um, qualities of of sound that we actually separate so pitch and then everything else which is timber right i'm shouting timber i'm sorry i do that every time um so yeah yeah that it's pretty cool i like it doesn't happen all the time um these are fast sounds that are repeating in in nature so you know it's not all it's not an active heuristic like the first two the location and the um onset uh heuristics which happen very fairly frequently right a couple more uh heuristics so proximity and time so sounds that occur in rapid succession usually come from the same source this is the second part of the um example for location with um the big vehicles backing up using static bursts or bursts of static as opposed to the um tone beep um but of course this heuristic works with that tone beep because it's coming from the same source because there it's beep 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 but it needs to work in relation to location to um a, a, you know give us the practical information of oh shoot i gotta get out the way otherwise i'm gonna get run over by somebody in a big truck that can't see me okay uh and then auditory continuity is the uh is the last one i think um in my yeah yeah this is the last uh, uh heuristic for organiz organization sounds that stay constant or change smoothly are usually from the same source okay um so examples of this are instruments okay sounds that stay constant obviously things that <laughs> obviously sounds that um pretty much of anything that you know that stays constant so your tv um even though it's a complex auditory scene in a television movie tv show whatever um you know it's coming from the tv because of the constant information that you're getting from the tv and the audio stream um instruments so a violin's not going to start a violin is not going to start um sounding like a french horn okay so the audit the the information that you get from a violin or a, any other stringed instrument sounds different than a um woodwind instrument or a brass instrument right um and so we we can keep those things separate and then of course we add categories to those sounds as well right let me know if you have any questions about any of these heuristics moving a f -f -f forward just drop them in chat and we'll come back to them um the effect of past experience okay so we did played a little bit of this i played with a little bit of this when we were talking about location um because of course location um and determining where sounds are coming from has a lot to do with past experience it's like the almost the number one thing to determine a sound's location is having experience with that sound but it also um is a part of organization which is why these two th concepts are in the same chapter and not two different chapters because past experience with sounds has a lot to do with what you know about sounds and where you find sounds um and so i don't necessarily need to um we don't need to go through that quiz uh, again but the other example is from um a study that was done uh by dowling it's it's actually really cool uh so they used three blind mice okay and so everybody knows three blind mice right three blind mice see how they run getting eaten by cats now uh but it's the first the the, the the first the intro verse right huh 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 
every most children and adults know that one and they tested this on u.s adults so u.s adults were familiar with the tune of three by three blind mice okay um, but they first asked people to listen to a sound where they modified Three Blind Mice, right? So they took the melody, and they alternated the melody between octaves, which is not the case in the normal melody, right? The normal melody stays in the same octave, where you can play it in higher octaves, but at least it stays in the same um, octave. But they alternated notes between octaves. So it was going high, then it was going low, then it was going high, then it was going low. The participants had no idea what they were listening to. Absolutely no idea what they were listening to. And so, um, and, and so they couldn't identify it, of course. That's because that was the question. Like, do you know what you're listening to? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. What is it? No. What do you think it is? Okay. Um, then they played the normal melody, just the, the regular, ha, 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 in, in the regular tune, right? They played that first, they primed the participants, and then they played the modified one. And they were like, oh, it's three blind mice. That's crazy. Holy crap. So they had previous experience. So they had previous experience with three blind mice, but they hadn't listened to it, you know, in any normal circumstance or whatever. Like, they weren't like, I'm going to go do an experiment with sound. Let me listen to Three Blind Mice. No, they weren't doing that. They probably hadn't heard it for a decade or more, right? How often do you hear Three Blind Mice playing in your normal life, you uh, 18 to 24-year-olds? Right? How often are you hearing that? Not often. I wager, I wager, I hazard, not often. Still experience with it, though. And then they played it for them, just in case they didn't have any experience with the melody. And then they played the, um, then they played the, uh, then the modified one. They were like, oh, yeah. Anyways, this episode of, of uh, Radio Lab. if you're not familiar with Radio Lab, it's an awesome science podcast. Um, they've been on for several years now. Um, they, this entire episode is about musical illusions. It's super fascinating. And obviously musical illusions are perfect for a listening only medium, right? Audio only. Um, uh, so it's really good. And so if you are a, um, audiophile, I totally recommend this ep episode of Radiolab. Um, obviously you can't click on the link. I think I may have left it in, um, I think I'm, oops, somebody's pinging me on Facebook. Uh, I, I think, uh, um, I left it in the slides. Tell me if I didn't, I don't remember. But if not, you can just do, uh, Radio Lab and Musical Illusions in Google and it'll take you right to this. I, it's a fascinating episode. Um, if you are an audiophile or curious, you know, and bored. Curious and bored. I'll, I'll, I'll say that. Um, all right. The uh, I'm probably gonna skip this. The flashed video you can um, find it on YouTube if you type in how flashes change sight. But uh, this is how ventriloquism works. Okay, so this is the first part of how vision and hearing are connected. Um, next week when we talk about uh, speech perception, oh, that's right. That is this is not the last hearing because we do have one more hearing, which is speech perception. Um, when we talk about speech perception, that'll be part two of vision and hearing. So this is part one, not to do with speech and vision connected, but it has to do with just hearing normal sounds connected. And it's called the two flash illusion. Okay. If you show somebody a flash of light and you just flash it back and forth, back and forth. So a single dot is flash on screen. Okay. Here's the crazy thing. Here's the f the friggin' crazy thing about this. You just flash it once. It's a two flash illusion. Okay? You flash it once, but if you play the flash, play the flash if on TV. If you show the flash the one time but with two beeps, you will see two flashes 
Actually, let me just play this because I think this is real quick. Yeah, 44 seconds. We can deal with that. We can dig it. So follow the directions on the screen. That's the illusion, right? Uh, raise your hand in chat if you um, saw the two flashes with two beeps. I did. <laughs> Thanks, Live Science. Science! That's nifty. Yeah, it is nifty, Jacob. Yeah. So that's part one of how hearing and vision are connected. Okay? That's part one. We'll do part two um, next week. We'll do part two next week. Yeah. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Um, all right. We're going to finish out by talking about deafness because um, y'all wanted me to do that. So let's let's finish up by talking about deafness, or at least hearing loss. Um, presbycusis is the first one. It's the first thing that we're going to talk about. So this is a specific disorder of hearing where um, the cochlea... Uh, can no longer um, hear high frequencies. So at the base of the at the base of the cochlea, we can't hear those high frequencies. So there's damage to the high frequencies. It affects males more than it does females. Okay, and I will say that most um, presbycusis cases come from. Um, Damaging noises, that is not wearing ear protection when listening to very loud, very, very loud um, uh, sounds. So if you work at an airport out on the tarmac, you should be having big old earphone, uh, earmuffs, headphones on. Um, otherwise, you will likely have presbycusis damage because that's the first thing that goes in the cochlea is that base where the stapes is connected, the round window and the oval window, as we discussed. Drugs can also do damage to the cochlea. Okay, drugs can also do damage to the cochlea. Here's the one that affects, that I think we're going to see, I, this is just my prediction, I think we're going to see um, noise-induced hearing loss um, in, in younger millennial generation, Gen Z, and things after, because of, of the... Um, wider spread usage of earphone earphones and specifically earbud type phones things that earphones that go in your ear um versus you know over the ear headphones like this one or even old school over the ear headphones which are like had the foam coverings they're basically speakers that sat on your ear your ears uh you you probably had a, a pair or two of those old school Walkman type, uh, old school Walkman type type ones. Um, the organ of Cordy is damaged by loud noises; can't handle them. Okay. Um, OSHA, the um, Occupational Safety Health Administration, Hazard Administration. I think it's occupational safety and health. I don't remember <laughs> from my time as having to put post uh, labor posters up on the wall. Um, sets standards for noise levels, um, and um, there are standards for the amount of noise levels that can be accompanied by work. Uh, like, l l let's go back to the airport workers. Uh, airport workers, especially if their job, like ba baggage handlers, um, food handlers, you know, food food cargo handlers, um, refuelers, they they have set time out on the tarmac. Uh, they have to go inside and away from all those loud noises periodically throughout the day because OSHA's like, even though they're wearing earmuffs, it's not fully protective it's, there's no way that it can be fully protective of their ears even if they're wearing these gigantic earmuffs it's it's just it's still very jet engines are very loud 
okay? Um, there is so much sound deadening that goes on in the fuselage of an airplane so that we, as passengers, don't actually have to wear headphones, right? And then they created noise-canceling headphones because they're like, oh, yeah, that's probably a good idea. It's kind of it's kind of crap, right? Um, those, so those headphones that you're using, just, you know, turn down a scotch. Turn down a scotch. Just a, just a smidge. Just a smidge. Um, this is a graph that compares uh, hair cell response of two um this i believe this is a 75 decibel sound pressure level so db spl and this is a hundred db spl okay so these are loud these are loud sounds okay um so one day relative response okay not bad, but if you did it over eight week, it's happening a lot. And this is what, this is the damage that's, dang it, I did it again. So this is not too bad. Green means good here. Not, so this is 75, 75 dB SPL. Eight weeks of it though, eight weeks of it though, you have almost 90% relative response from these hair cells inside the organ of Corti. That's gonna. That's how it gets damaged, okay. And then auditory nerve response is um, very low because you habituate to the sound. Seventy-five dB SPL versus a hundred dB SPL. Um, it's not. It's not great. It's not great, Bob. Okay. So permanent damage. Uh, so I think what what the graphs are trying to tell you, the response of the auditory nerve fiber is also decreased one day after the exposure, but also fails to recover at eight weeks, indicating permanent damage. You want this to be up here. Normal is 100%. You can see that um, normal is not obtained by 75 followed by two hours exposure to... 100 db spl now i don't believe you're listening to i don't believe you are listening to your headphones at 100 db spl i promise if you were listening to your headphones at 100 db spl you probably feel pain at some at some point i know that's not the pain threshold but it is probably pretty loud you'd probably be like oh my god it's so loud okay so just um yeah just turn down just scotch now other forms of deafness would then be uh, a place where you would put uh, cochlear implants in. So other forms of deafness include conduction deafness and cochlear deafness. So conduction deafness, deafness can occur at any stage along the ear, okay? So the eardrum or the ossicles, okay, can also include cochlear damage. You can also have... Um, conduction deafness, which is damage from the cochlea onto the um, auditory nerve. So those are two other forms of deafness. Um, conduction deafness can occur from a s significant blow to your head. Uh, conduction deafness, generally speaking, is uh, a factor or a factor a uh, a result of um, genes. Or like a like a, a congenital defect, or um, uh, some, some form of sickness. So I, Helen Keller again, she had scarlet fever. Scarlet fever affected um, conduction, right? So that is from the cochlea through the auditory nerve through the sonic MGN, right? Um, and so cochlear implants are a way to assist with. Uh, Conduction deafness, okay, or cochlear damage, okay, and it's a, um, a pretty interesting thing. So you have a battery pack. Um, these batteries are getting quite a bit smaller these days, uh, but it's a battery pack and a wire that goes to a speaker that sits on behind the ear of the person who has the implant. So you may have seen those because it's a speaker, or it's just, I guess it's a microphone, Um and then the number three 
this thing here, number three, is um, the transmitter, which is in the mastoid bone. It's embedded in the mastoid bone, which is this bone here, okay? Um, and then there is a wire that is implanted into, into um, the cochlea, so around it, and it's supposed to, um, I'm gonna go ahead and, Emma, let me go ahead and break up your message into um, uh, chunks or uh, this, the reduce the size of it. One of my ways of being, sorry, one of my ways of being um, vigilant about trolls. Um, so, yeah, that's a, that's a cochlear implant. That's it for this stuff. So, uh, are there any questions, um, for, for me on hearing, right? Speech perception notwithstanding, because that is, uh, that is not on this quiz. I will take your questions. It is 2.53, so if you need a skadoodle, see you later. Like I said, I will be streaming later tonight for that chill stream that I emailed you all about. Um, yeah. Otherwise, uh, I'm going to go ahead and end the recording here. Uh, but I will stick on the stream.